Hey, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, going to be a, an exciting, exciting uh, panel today because uh, um, we have a very distinguished uh, speaker whom I have high honor to introduce. He's a good friend of mine, uh, Professor Joseph uh, Tervillinger from Columbia University. Uh, again, I want you to remember two things about uh, our next uh, distinguished speaker. Number one, here's the puzzle solver. Now, why do I call him a puzzle solver? He's a specialist uh, in genetics from Columbia University, my uh, alma mater. You know, we went to the same school with him. Um, you know, he looks in the audience here in Korea, they're all Koreans. Koreans in the United States, Koreans in uh, Uzbekistan, Koreans in uh, uh, Paraguay, wherever. And he tries to find that gene, you know, which is responsible. I don't know why they love kimchi or why uh, they're so smart and build the smartest phones and the smartest TVs and the smartest uh, cars and the smartest cities in the world. So he can solve that puzzle. If you ever wondered, you know, why Koreans in the South you know, build the best things in the world, and Koreans in the North build the best bombs and missiles in the world, he is the person who can probably uh, give you a hypothesis. Now, so he is a puzzle solver. But there is another uh, thing about him uh, which uh, is very important, and that is he is the bridge builder. Why do I call him a bridge builder? And that's, you know, he works in Libya. He works uh, in Venezuela. He works uh, in uh, Xinjiang uh, on different uh, genetics-related projects. But more importantly, as far as I'm concerned, he is the only person, he is the only person who tried to build a real bridge. It's a 50-mile bridge across the DMZ you know, to the other Korea. And how did he try to do it? Very simple. I mean, we all hate one man. I mean, mo most of us hate one monster, you know, uh, residing in Pyongyang. Uh, many don't understand him. Uh, actually, no one, no one met him, spoke ever with him, you know, saw him. And yet that man, you know, can put his finger on the button and basically eliminate the city, annihilate, you know, everybody here except one person who actually met him. And he didn't meet him once, he didn't meet him twice, he didn't meet him three times, he met him four times. And that's Professor Terwillinger, who met Kim Jong-un four times. He spent numerous hours with him, basically trying to understand the man, the dear leader, trying to educate the man, tell him about the world around him, and in the process, he also tried to educate our basketball star, Dennis Rodman, who happened to be as part of the delegation who met with Kim Jong-un. And when, to me, you know, when Kim Jong-un allowed my good friend Joseph here to hold his baby, his sole child at that time, in his hands, uh, that was the ultimate expression of trust, you know, in uh, my good friend. So, let me use this opportunity to present to you a true scholar, an artist, and Joseph plays tuba, believe it or not, at Carnegie Hall in his free time. He also impersonates Abraham Lincoln, which when Kim Jong-un asked him to do, he went ahead and basically delivered the Gettysburg Address uh, in Pyongyang. Uh, he is a true gentleman and uh, a good friend of mine. Professor Terlinger, thank you. Wow. Hi, <laughs> uh, I'm I'm Joe, and uh, I felt it was a it was a, a bit strange when I first got the request from Alexander to speak on theology and Pacific Rim culture, since I'm a human biologist and I don't really claim to know anything about theology. I don't know much about the topic at all, um, except what I've gleaned from being at these conferences. This is my second time attending this conference, and I've 
learned a lot by just being around everybody here. And, you know, as, as Alexander said, you know, my work is mostly in human genetics. And in human genetics, what we're really interested in is studying the variation between human beings. What makes us all different? What makes us the same? And I work, I, I'm, in human beings, when you want to study biology, you can't do experiments, right? I can't say, uh, Alexander, I'd like you and Cheryl to give me 10 babies so I can put them in cages and feed them different foods and see what happens to them, right? You can't do that. What we have to do is look where situations in the world or historical experience has led to something that's a kind of, like an experiment you would want to do. So for me, when I see the world or I see people or I'm working with uh, different cultures and different populations, I try just to observe, to learn, to study, to try to understand what makes people as different as they are, and then try to you know, figure out what's going on in terms of biology or in terms of other areas. So I'm, I'm a very curious person as a, as a scientist. But the thing is, I don't know anything about international relations, about politics, about theology, about any of this stuff. I just know that I'm curious, and I see a question, I want to answer the question, I want to understand it. So I started my career with doing a study, uh, the first study of this type I did was in Venezuela, as Alexander mentioned. And we found an interesting population there of native people who all lived in one community, had 5,000 people in one family, and I, like everybody's been saying here, I love families, families are great, because also for our research, because we want to study what makes families similar. Why are people in the same family more similar to each other? People in the same culture, the same ethnic group, what makes them the same? Or what makes them different, right? So there we had 5,000 people, all of whom were exposed to all kinds of nasty things. In Venezuela, there's all kinds of pollution from the oil industry. They all have worms in their stomachs. All kinds of problems. They, if you there's a lot of violence too. If somebody wants to kill someone, you can rent a gun for an hour and, and then you do what you have to do and then you give it back. So the same gun is used in every crime. They never can find out who did it, right? It's not like on CSI where they trace the gun. So you would think this is a terrible population with terrible health. But what we find is if they live to be 40 years old, they live to be 100, their brains look perfect, their health is good, they don't have cardiovascular disease, cancer, or anything else. So to me, that's a great question. Well, why is it that they live in such a bad condition and are still so healthy? And one answer of that was, in this case, it might be the worms. And we all are, were appalled when we saw the, you saw the defector run across the DMZ a few months ago, or last year, I guess, and he, they found the worms in his stomach, and everyone's, oh, that's horrible. Well, remember, in South Korea, everybody took pills for worms maybe 20 years ago at most, right, at, at least. It's the common. It was everywhere in human species. And the immune system we have grew up together with the worms. So it was an army, and it had an enemy, and they were at peace, right? There's a stable relationship between the two. What happened is you remove the worms, and it attacks itself. The, you have a big army, and it, you have a lot of revolution, if you will. So. This is an interesting question, right? And it's only answerable, you can only look at this because there's some unusual thing in society where it looks bad, and then you look at it closely and you say, well, actually, our concepts of what's good or bad for health or anything else aren't always what you think they are, right? So again, when I have a question, I always want to look, I think this is bad for you, I want to go look at it and see, is it really bad for you? So you look at it, you ask the question, you take advantage of what's occurred by chance in nature, and you ask about it, right? So I had a study. After that, I was, I was studying Korean language in, uh, in college. So yeah, uh, so I, I studied Korean. And in, when I was studying it, I went to the bookstore, and I saw a book about Koreans of Central Asia. And I was like, why are there Koreans in Central Asia? How did they get there? Why are they, uh, is this book wrong? Are they in Kazakhstan? Which I, no one has ever, I'd never heard of Kazakhstan really, right? I'm an American. We, according to our Secretary of State, most people can't find Ukraine on a map. <laughs> so I was curious. This is a question to me. Why are they there? What's interesting about it? And as a geneticist, I'm saying, hmm, the more I read, I said, 
these have the same genes, these two populations, but they live in different, totally different environment. And what happened was there were Koreans that had lived in North Korea where there were floods and famines in the 1800s. Not all of the floods and famines are because of the regime. The nature plays a big role in that. And they had a big problem in the 1800s before this was an issue. And they fled to Russia. Because in Russia, in the Russian Far East, there was a lot of land and they could cultivate the soil and grow things, right? So Stalin, in 1937, deported the entire Korean population of the Russian Far East to Kazakhstan, which is taking them from near the ocean to the farthest place on earth from the ocean. The entire culture changed, the language was lost, they destroyed, you know, the Russians at the time got rid of all the all of Korean culture in these people and basically took the same plants. It's like in agriculture, if we want to study corn, you grow the same corn in two different soils with different fertilizer and different crops and you see what happens to them. That's how you do the science. So I was interested, fascinated by the Korean history. The sadness of the last 150 years of Korean history that led to Koreans being spread all over the world, isolated from each other in, in these very separate places, makes for a fascinating scientific experiment. No one would ever want to do that to people, but when it happened because of history, you can go and ask a question. Well, what's the difference? How do genes and environment both contribute to who we are? Yes? So we asked the question, and I looked at Koreans in Kazakhstan, Koreans in China, who until about, until about two, year 2000 mostly had connections with North Korea, very little with South Korea. Now it's the opposite, but and that changed very fast. But there were these separate groups. And then another really interesting group to me was that there were a lot of uh, Swedish soldiers stationed in the DMZ after the war. They had some children, as soldiers do. And they didn't fit very well in South Korean society, so a lot of them were adopted internationally to Sweden. And the program worked so well, they started doing that with a lot of uh, ethnically pure Korean children who were suffering, who, you know, the families were suffering in the poverty after the Korean War. So here you had a whole group of people who are completely Korean, but their parents are bonds. And so it's an interesting question. What makes them different, right? So I got really curious and I wanted to use this to answer a question. Well, I was in China and in Kazakhstan working, and I met all these people from North Korea. And they were nothing like the stereotype I had imagined. You know, you read books about North Korea, you hear what it's like, and you get this concept of robots and people who are brainwashed walking around in a certain way, all wanting to kill the world and destroy everybody. And then you meet them and you realize they're surprisingly friendly. They're almost like, hi, how are you? You know, very innocent. Uh, in Korean, there's the word, you know, sobakada. And that pretty much describes it. It's kind of simple, naive, innocent, almost like children in a way. And I'm like, this isn't what I expected. So I'm a scientist, I'm curious, I ask a question. And I talk to them. And the more I talk to them and try to understand them, not judging people, but talking to people. And I learn a lot of things about what makes them tick. Why, how are they different? And it just keeps you getting more and more curious because it's such a different society from what we live in. So I got to go there for the first time in 2010. I went as a, as a tourist because I was curious. And that initial introduction, again, I thought I knew everything because I read everybody's books, all the books I could find about the place, and nothing was like I expected it to be. It was different, very different, but not different in the way you expect. So again, to me, personally, if I were to think of my own political views, I'm a libertarian, a conservative. I, I, don't like being told what to do by anybody, you know? <laughs> and I like to think freely, and I, that's how I always imagine everything should be. You know, the more freedom you have, the better, and all that. And North Korea is about as opposite from that as you can possibly get. So for me, that's, again, it makes me curious. I'm fascinated. How does society organize itself? How does it work? How do people live in this society, and are they really that different? So I went there. I went back again a couple of years later by myself. I spent 10 days going around North Korea, and actually that's when I met Alexander, <laughs> Dr. Mansarov. <laughs> and um, I, again, more and more curious. Every time I thought I understood it, something else would happen, and I didn't quite understand. And I'm just, I'm, I'm not 
a political expert. I'm not a culture expert. I'm not a politician. I certainly have no role in government. And as such, I'm not threatening. I just go there and I talk to people. And you talk to people and you build a bridge and you make a connection. It's kind of, it, it was an eye-opening experience and I was fascinated again. So I had the chance a couple of years after that to go to Yunbin in China again. I was working with the Chinese Koreans and there was a summer class on the North Korean dialect of the language. Again, fascinated. I want to learn about this. There was a professor from North Korea teaching foreigners how to speak Korean. So I went, I studied, I listened, I learned, I, I just listened. And as a scientist, it's, you know, I always think of my role when I go to different countries and different cultures and interact with people, I try to think of it as like, you know, you ever watch the TV show Star Trek? You know, Captain Kirk always said the prime directive is to not interfere in foreign civilizations, but just simply observe and try to learn from the experience. And that's kind of what I did when I went to North Korea. So I went back, I had the chance to teach at the Pyongyang University of Science and Technology, which is a university that most of the faculty are evangelical Christians from America who are of Korean descent, who go to Pyongyang and teach science, business, capitalism. This is what they want to learn. They want to learn capitalism. They want to learn English. They want to learn business. They want to learn biology. That's great, I think. You teach them about things, and they want to learn, and you can expose people to us, and we can learn about them. And it, to me, it was a fascinating opportunity to really get to know people. And build, you build a bridge that way. You get to talk to them. You get to think about them. And the more time I spent there, the more you start to really just see that they're exactly the same as we are. They have the same concerns. Everyone I know, I have a lot of friends now in the North. And all they care about is what's, what's going on with my children. My child's misbehaving at school, or he didn't do his homework, and I got to go punish him, or he went behind the school and got caught smoking, or he was drinking, or he's the same as in America. You know, it's not different. And this, again, isn't the way North Korea is often thought about by people. They think, oh, they're all in cages, and they're running around, and they're not living as normal people. But life is surprisingly normal. It's, it's almost boring. There's not a lot to do. You're just with your family, your friends, and all this stuff. And, and I've had a lot of really interesting experiences that have been very positive as a result of that, dealing with people as people and just trying to learn, you know? And I think there's a lot of problems in, whenever I talk with people that are experts in politics or anything else, the first problem is everybody goes into the problem thinking that they have a model. My model is this is how they think, this is how we think, and they go like this. And they never quite get to a point where they can understand each other because they go in thinking, okay, these guys are good, these guys are evil, we wear white hats, they wear black hats. And so people don't really try to understand each other or talk to each other. But that's what I've always tried to do when I've been there. And this is how I had the chance to go there, as, as Alexander said, with, with Dennis Rodman, as organizing his trips and helping to translate for him when he met with with uh, Chairman Kim. And again, he was very friendly with us, very open, very honest. He, we treated him like one of the guys, and he treated us like a normal person. It wasn't anything like you might imagine. Just two people talking to each other. And Dennis, you know, the interesting story, Dennis's agent wrote a book about the trip. He said, how did Dennis end up going there? He said, well, you know, he got a contract offer from from a Vice magazine, they said, would you go to North Korea and with the Harlem Globetrotters and play a basketball game? And his agent said, yeah, sure, K-pop, Psy, wonderful. <laughs> they didn't know there were two Koreas, so. <laughs> he had no idea. He just went there and he goes, yeah, sure, God wants to meet me, sure, I'll meet him, you know. Uh, when he was there at the game, I, I was translating some for him with Kim Jong-un, and Dennis asked Kim Jong-un, can I meet Sai? <laughs> and Kim Jong-un says, well, I'd like to meet him. Can you help me? <laughs> I mean, it was, it's very, yeah, yeah. I mean, this is the, the thing. When you treat people like people, they treat you back like people, right? You talk to him like a normal person, he talks back to you like that, and you can build some kind of a relationship that you can go forward from, right? That's how it is with all human beings. That's what this conference is about, from what I can see. You have people here, they disagree about more fundamental things than Kim Jong-un and Moon Jae-in disagree about, right? 
Religion is an intimately personal thing, and it's what you believe is the centerpiece of one's ideology, one's life, right? Well, you have people here that are Muslims, Jews, Christians, Buddhists, everything. They disagree about things that are far more significant in some way, and yet they come here because they can see there's a commonality between it where there's a common shared experience, as you were just talking about. So isn't that, isn't that kind of what's missing somehow in these international relations context is that we know what we want. We don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons, right? Well, if you're Kim Jong-un, what do you want? You are, he told me, and he told Dennis and us personally, he said, you guys told, you guys made a deal with Gaddafi from Libya. You said, you get rid of your nuclear weapons and we'll give you a guarantee of security. And then we killed Gaddafi. And he said, you know, and then he said, you told Saddam Hussein, you made Saddam Hussein send weapons inspectors into his country. The weapons inspectors said there were no weapons of mass destruction there. You didn't believe the weapons inspectors, you killed Saddam Hussein. Why would I trust the security guarantee? When America is going out as an active policy saying, we won't, we won't have, uh, right, okay, we will, always, uh, we will not take first use of nuclear weapons off the table. We want to change the regime. That's not, it's an open secret, right? No one's pretending otherwise. As he said, I'm not that stupid, right? I, I don't want to blow anybody up. I don't want to do anything like that, but what do I do? And the point is that those two worldviews are like this, and nobody tries to understand the other guy's perspective like people are doing in this room and in this conference, right? You're trying to understand the other guy and get along with him. Reverend Moon went to North Korea to talk to Kim Il-sung. He talked to Gorbachev. He didn't like what they believed in, but he talked to them. Why? Because you talk to someone, you can find some common ground, you can build a bridge, you can go somewhere, right? You build a hotel, you start a car company in the North, right? Isn't that a way that you start interacting with people so they don't see you as the bad guy? I mean, you know, I've had the students at the university, they'll talk to me and they'll, they'll be very open about things I'm surprised they would be open about. But there's a trust that you build, right? You build trust by having an interaction. You show that you're not trying to kill, to kill them and that you're just like they are. When Dennis Rodman went to North Korea, we had a basketball team. They were all African Americans, right? And they played a basketball game with the North Korean team. Half the game, it was US versus North Korea. The second half, each team had half North Koreans and half Americans working together. The basketball was much more interesting because the North Koreans were short but, but fast and they could really shoot. The Americans were tall and slow and old and fat, and, but they were big. So it was a very boring game when they played against each other. When they played together, it was wonderful because they each had some contribution to it. And the images that we all wish came out to the world from that game were these African-American guys and these North Koreans arm in arm playing a game and, and cheering for each other. And so to me, that's what it's about, right? You gotta start somewhere. And I'm just, I'm just a scientist. When I go to different countries, and as he said, I, I was in Libya uh, working with the Libyans last week because my university and the University of Tripoli were trying to start an academic collaboration so that we can help them recover their academic culture through this time of civil war that they're going through. You know, the president of the University of Tripoli was an old colleague of mine when he was a graduate student. We worked together to find the gene for lactose intolerance. And you build these connections, you keep it together, and we're trying to use that now to do something positive there, right? So you can work in any of these countries, you can build a relationship to people, only if you're a private person, it seems. Because I'm not a threat, I'm not government, I have no wishes, I'm not judging people, I'm not telling them how to live, I'm just listening to them. And I think, again, that goes along with a lot of the theological sort of way of viewing the world, the religious way, is to embrace other people, love your enemies, right? Talk to them, treat them with respect, and try to find some way to get along with each other. So, again, that's just the view of a dumb scientist to tuba player who doesn't really know much about theology, doesn't know anything about foreign relations, doesn't know anything about diplomacy, and I don't want to have anything to do with government. I don't want to be part of it. I, I don't really like being them when they tell me what to do either. I just want to try to get along with people, and if those people happen to be someone like Kim Jong-un, that might be a good thing, right? 
you build a friendship with him. You show him that there's Americans he can trust. Maybe someone else will pick up the ball from Dennis when he gets the rebound and go run with it and score something. We're hoping. I would add that when we met Kim Jong-un the first time, 2013, we came back to the United States. We didn't, no one in the US government really knew we were going because we were, did a very good job of keeping it quiet and not talking about it. And he just went and we, we, we played the game. The administration was not happy. <laughs> so nobody wanted anything to do with Dennis. They disowned him. He suffered enormous consequences for going there, even though he didn't even understand because he, he's just like, what, the guy likes me. We start a conversation. Um, I like him, he likes me. Maybe we can do something. Maybe you build on that, open the door. The person who called us, there's one, only one person called in 2013 and wanted a conversation, and that was Donald Trump. And he, Dennis and Donald Trump were old friends because Dennis was on his TV show, Celebrity Apprentice, and they'd worked together in the, in the, in the, in the 80s and 90s, even when Dennis was playing basketball, they did some TV things together. And so he called Dennis to his office, and what he said to Dennis was, what you did is wonderful. He said, anything you do to start a conversation with these people and talk to them is better than shooting at them. And that, that's President Trump. And I think that there's something to be, be said for this, that you know, I honestly think he, he wants to solve this problem. I don't know that he knows how. I don't know that anyone knows how. But at least there's steps being made to try to, to get over it and, and build some sort of a peaceful future. And you know, I'm optimistic. Things haven't gone as good as we would expect. For me, it's pretty terrible that I'm no longer allowed to go there. That we now have uh, travel bans like the Soviet Union had preventing us from leaving. Let's hope that that goes away eventually and that something can be done before, you know, before it's too late. Anyway, thank you very much for your time and for listening to an idiot who knows nothing about theology. <laughs>